Well, thank you for everybody for joining us. Um, this is, I believe, uh, my fourth uh, read capital markets uh, update since COVID containment started. Uh, gosh, what, 13 months ago uh, already. Um, <clears throat> Things uh, have changed a lot, but in many respects, it, it seems like not much has changed. Um, but given a lot of the uh, things that have changed and a lot of the marketplace and, and noise, I should have probably had as well. Um, Professor Harris, uh, David Harris, who's joining me on, on today's discussion. And I went back and forth a little bit on a, uh, a, a misquoted quote you can see here on the screen. Um, I had originally tossed out um, uh, Philip Fisher's uh, quote, uh, and David Harris, who's much more learned than me, corrected me. It was an Oscar Wilde quote. Uh, and I, I actually put them both up here because I think both, um, both iterations of them make a lot of sense for uh, what we're looking at in the marketplace today. Um, so hopefully we can weed, wade through some of, this, uh, some of these topics over the next uh, 55 minutes or so. Uh, if you have questions, uh, the chat box uh, is available. Send chats. Uh, if you have my, my cell phone, you can definitely text me as well. Uh, raise your hand. We'll, we'll do our best to incorporate your questions into the conversation. Um, but before we want to get started, a uh, uh, housekeeping note. Um, selfishly, uh, I want to let to... you know the screen is not showing your slides. Why is it not? How about now? There you go. Looks good. Yep. Okay. Well, then we'll go back and, and you guys can see the quote here. <laughs> um, selfishly, I want Lady, to. I have to say, interject. It's from Lady Windermere's fan, and you should go see the play whenever you get a chance. As well as the importance of being earnest. It's, as I it's said, one of the, it's one of the treasures of the theatre, right? <laughs> um, selfishly, I want to promote the uh, the REIT Symposium, which is uh, coming up in a few weeks, uh, April sixth and seventh. You can find the agenda online. Uh, you can register online at the um, the URL there listed on the screen. Uh, we've got, I think, nine panels uh, teed up over the two days, plus four uh, one-on-one slash fireside chats with read executives. Uh, we're also doing an, an extra day this year. Uh, April 8th is going to be research day. Uh, we're going to have a few extra panels uh, digging uh, deep into some of the topics you see here listed on the screen, uh, global REIT regimes and emerging economies, mortgage REITs, uh, and some REIT corporate governance and ESG topics. So uh, definitely register. Uh, there's a mix of free and pay-per-view uh, components to the symposium, so it should be great. Uh, I want to start here with uh, REIT performance. Uh, over the past year, uh, Calvin Schneer, Robert Nary did, a, I think, a, a great job of highlighting uh, where the REIT sector has been over this, this COVID containment period going back to February of last year. Um, and the way he viewed it, and, and, I, and I do agree with it, is he kind of divided the, this historical performance into three segments. Um, when COVID was really coming to the forefront of our minds and the market was starting to melt down and we had no idea what was going on. Um, and then I, will, I'll, I won't call it the recovery period, but the markets did recover a lot, largely due to the amount of monetary stimulus that came into the market from Fed and Treasury. And you can see uh, the chart on the upper, upper right of your screen, uh, a bit of a stabilization uh, of the REIT market, a little, little uptick, a little uh, stabilization. And then um, things changed a little bit more uh, after the elections uh, toward year end. And in the beginning of this year, um, we feel like we're moving into an opening, uh, reopening phase. Uh, nobody knows how much of that reopening is really priced into the market. Uh, we don't know really the exact timing of the reopening and where the economy really kind of stabilizes and starts growing from. Um, is it going to look more like uh, immediately prior to the containment efforts in late 2019? Are we going to grow significantly because of all the stimulus that's been put in the marketplace combined with the pent up demand from the past 14 months? Um, is this going to drive inflation and that's going to you know, stoke uh, price increases and in, in maybe damper uh, economic activity. We're really not sure, uh, which gets back to that, uh, there's this two opening quotes that uh, David and I put at the beginning of the screen. Um, but I think uh, also in the lower left of this slide, um, you can see um, there definitely has been segmentation early on in this capital markets recovery period. Uh, and there's been a bit of a, a rebalancing, if you will, of that trade. You can see early on uh, recovery sector or sectors that performed well, uh, anything digital, whether it's data centers, cell towers, um, anything related e-commerce, industrial. Um, and believe it or not, um, 
single family rentals, uh, as well as hospitality and medical office. I think that last category was initially a little bit unforeseen, um, but once it became obvious how much VC money was being uh, thrown at, at COVID research and, and people started thinking about the longer term unintended positive consequences of that. Uh, I think everybody's getting their head around the fact that there's going to be lo strong long-term demand uh, for the entire um, health and uh, medical office building sector. Lagging sectors, uh, no big surprise on the lower left there, hotel and gaming retail office. Uh, senior housing. Uh, they've been recovering. It's been a bit of this rebalancing trade, if you will, um, lately, sector rotation, uh, which Professor Harris and I will get into uh, in a little bit. Digging in a little bit greater detail, you can see some of the actual performance numbers um, year to date, as well as uh, last year. Uh, top performers last year, bottom performers, again, no surprise here. Um, but you can see uh, if at some point the reopening trade got, um, got you excited to move into the marketplace, there were some pretty obvious places uh, to jump in and potentially bottom feed, so long as you had the stomach to, uh, to weather the reopening uncertainty um, and if there was more downside to, to come to some of these sectors or not. Uh, David, I don't know if you have anything additional to add to these two slides. Uh, yeah, just before you move on, I just sort of, uh, sort of more of a general overlay to the REIT performance. And although that chart indicates that we've been kind of basically half winners and half losers, the whole sector underperformed last year relative to the market. I mean, I'll get the data here, the SPX, if, which is the S&P 500 and the principal equity index that we most of us refer to. That was up 16% last year. Obviously, uh, tech led the way and you have some laggard sectors. But if we look at the REITs, if you measure actually on a total return basis, um, we, were, we were up 5%. Um, so 16 plays five um, because the general investor, who is really the determinant of price in the REIT market, um, that's the whole other conversation we can raise perhaps at the end. Uh, but today, the REIT prices are really determined by the perspective of the general investor, the institutional investor. And they perceive the, the, the REIT sector for better or for worse, and again, it could be a point we raise later, as defensive and interest rate sensitive. So, um, you know, the, the, uh, early on, obviously, if we go back to March and April, the Fed moved very decisively and quickly um, to lower interest rates and, and bolster the, the bond market through its bond buying. Um, and then we also had the CARES Act, so we had a, a one-two in terms of support, both uh, budgetary as well as fiscal. Uh, but then as we went later into the year, uh, we started to get in this environment, which we'll chat about much more later, where we got this rot these rotational forces going on. Um, and, um, and people have been concerned that inflation is going to beget higher interest rates, and that is putting pressure on, on areas that are perceived to have rate sensitivity, such as REITs. Uh David, from your perspective as an investor, do you see uh, additional upside from some of these top performing sectors as we go through 2021, or is this going to be more of a, a continuation of the rotation trade? Uh, well, so far, what we've seen is, is really the reopening trade, and that really started at the end of last year. It's not purely a 21 phenomena. Um, and really, if you think about it in terms of allocating capital, if we think about the tech stocks in general, um, so the big leading, the, the leading five, so the apples and uh, and, and Googles of this world, et cetera, they represent about 25, they represented over 25% of the market, right? So if you're gonna go as an institutional manager, a little underweight there, there's a lot of money to go around. Now the REITs represent 2%, you know, energy was down 3% to 3%, utilities were 2%. You know, it doesn't take that much money coming out of, out of tech to, to really cause there to be some kind of an uplift in, um, in the REITs. Um, so um, and then those other those other areas that are getting a little bit of a um, a little bit of a bid, and there's a sort of two-way pull uh, that's gone on this year. The, the REITs have performed in line actually with the overall market, the S and P, which is a bit of a surprise given, you know, the dominant theme this quarter has really been the you know fears of rising inflation, and, and that has meant that you've seen this enormous spike in in long treasuries, and we can talk a bit more about that a little later, uh, but the um, uh, but, you know, you would have thought that that would have put the REITs under pressure, but it seems like, you know, they've got a bid because you're getting this reallocation out of the, the monster sector in terms of capital. Um, and also people are kind of more encouraged that, um, you know, the economy is going to steam along. We've just had the Fed 
up its GDP forecast, um, what was it, 10 days a week, 10 days ago, to 6.5%. Well, you know, 25 3% is, is, is a very healthy economy. So to be doing double that, right, even though we're coming out, obviously, of the, the, this, this very unusual circumstance of, of COVID, is just an extraordinary speed at which the economy is, is, is expected to pick up pace this year. And that will feed through to, to better earnings prospects across the board. And, um, and, and as I said, I think that's why we're seeing this two-way pull between the interest rate sensitivity that makes people you know, bearish about a sector like REITs. And yet we're seeing on the other side, uh, you know, the fundamental picture actually looking pretty bright. I mean, we're not looking at oversupply pretty much in, in most sectors. I mean, we can talk about you know, CBD office and coastal apartments, which are kind of you know, a sector by sector analysis. But overall, you'd have to say, we're not looking at too much new supply, creating that be a problem where you won't see some pricing pressure as, as the economy um, um, underpins uh, extra space demand. Yeah, and look, I think you and I've had this conversation a few times that this recovery, let's let's assume it's it's kicking in now, uh, is going to look like a more traditional economic recovery. If I go back, you know, a few cycles ago, whereby there's going to be a granular uh, differential in performance between geographic markets, between property types, as opposed to what I think we saw coming out of the GFC, where a bit of a rising tide lifted all boats. Uh, all markets did seemingly fairly well and all property types fairly, you know, recovered fairly uh, in, in unison. I think we're going to see a little more segmentation in this, in this situation. So um, thinking about that reopening trade, it's not necessarily going to come down to just buying a basket of, of hotel stocks or retail stocks. It's going to be, or office stocks. It's going to be getting granular into markets, which markets are going to underperform and lag or which ones might, might come out earlier. Is that correct? Yeah, I think the other thing that uh, crosses my mind too is that, um, you know, as I said, the um, for reasons we can talk about later, you know, the the determiner of value, the, the incremental buyer or seller of the REIT stocks is principally a generalist investor today. I I think that they may be overestimating uh, the speed at which earnings can recover in in real estate. Um, and I think we may be, you know, for example, it's going to be a couple of years before hotel earnings are going to be back to where they were in 22. And that's assuming, you know, all goes well with vaccination, not just in the US and Europe, but also around the rest of the world. I mean, again, I'm certainly no expert, but we've all become kind of, you know, semi-informed on, on COVID. Uh, we need this to be effective over the planet. Otherwise, we're going to get variants emerging in, in countries where, vaccination rates are low and they inevitably will come to to threaten you know the um, the the apparent calm that we've got in um, in developed countries so it's great that countries are moving forward with the vaccine but you know I'm, I'm a bit worried again we could be getting a little like over our ski ahead of our over our skis in terms of um, underestimating the challenge that we, we face on a global level um, and I think that uh, again, uh, for those that have been through the property cycle before, you know that you need to see an economy grow before space demand it manifests itself as people hire, uh, you know, folks for new jobs and they, you know, expand their apartments or buy a new home, etc. It all takes, you know, we're a laggard on the cycle. We're a derivative and a laggard on the economic cycle. So, okay, we've got this tremendous economic bounce that we're going to get, but next year you see the Fed if you look to the Fed's forecast, I mean, they were at three, was it three one for uh, GDP growth in 22. They itched it up, they moved up from to six five and four two this year. I think they only moved it to 10 basis points next year. So it went to three two, right? So we're seeing a, a considerable deceleration. Now, you know, low threes is a very healthy number, but you'd expect, you know, in the second year of an economic recovery, if it were anything like a normal cycle, we'd be accelerating off of a good first year instead of actually decelerating. So now, you know, investors tend to look a year, 18 months in a normal kind of market environment ahead with discounting events. So we're kind of looking at buying stocks really on 22 numbers at the moment, more than, um, more than perhaps 21. Uh, but, um, you know, there isn't too much thinking about where we're going to be in 23, 24 with any certainty. And, Quite frankly, if anybody's there, they're way ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Um, we can hold off on the inflation and interest rate conversation a little bit when we get right. to the next slide. But if I look at this slide, um, you know, what do you think is going through investors' minds when they see dividend yield? Let's just look at the top line. You know, three and a half, three hundred seven, three point seven five uh, percent relative to a two-year treasury or two percent uh, ten-year treasury. Is that 150, 175 basis point um, pretty good relative to other opportunities? And if I think about lease renewals, uh, maybe coming out in the wash and not a lot of price change as a result, earnings are going to be relatively flat, maybe in real estate across the board uh, in 21. Is that yield still pretty relatively attractive? I think so, although that has more appeal for a retail investor, the individual investor, than it does for the institution. I mean, the institutional investor is still kind of, you know, I mean, we've been in an environment where you play growth, right? There are very brief periods where value has actually worked better than, 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 um, than, than growth. Um, and so the mindset of most people, I mean, and most people really, and this is where we sound like ancient, I sound like an ancient dinosaur for sure, is if you've been through the cycle, you know, there are equal periods. Um, actually, the periods are very similar in terms of, you know, if you go back 50, 60 years, growth has kind of done as well as, as uh, value has done as well as growth over most of that period on an equal basis and produce similar results, actually. Um, but, you know, most people active in the market today and I wonder that in particular, the people that are programming the bots and the algos only have experienced really an up phase. You know, this, we've had this 30 year market, which where we've been driven by, you know, lower interest, sorry, lower inflation, which has really been a global phenomenon. I think it's really associated with the emergence of China as much as anything else and the aging of a population in the West, quite frankly. But that has really allowed central banks the world over, led by the Fed, to reduce rates. And basically, it's allowed you know, asset price appreciation to occur. You've had multiple expansion, and it's occurred, obviously, within cap, cap rate compression. You can see it in REITs and real, real estate. But it's occurred within um, the price of other risk assets as well. Um, we do appear to be coming. You know, it's hard to imagine we're not at the bottom of that cycle. It's going to be going up. From here, you know, we're at zero. Where you know, you know, you could go, you could argue, okay, well, we've seen negative returns on sovereign bonds in the rest of the world. But I, I would argue that that's an aberration and not a particularly successful experiment for people to go there. It really distorts your yeah. financial system and allocation of capital. Yeah. So, uh, but again, to your point on yield, I think it really is, you know, uh, continues to be really rather overlooked by institutional investors. But interestingly enough, you know, when we spike to 170. Um, and now we're down kind of in the low 60s. If you look at the yield on the 10 year, that was almost bang in line with, you know, the uh, what we're getting by way of a dividend yield on S&P. Now that strikes to me that makes it look like equities generally are really rather cheap. But if you then use 170 and compare it to a 350 number, which probably is only going to go up from here. I mean, we saw dividend cuts last year, but we probably now that in the rear view mirror, hopefully, if we see a little inflation, you know, I mean, I can't for the life of me think why anybody, unless they have to, would be buying fixed income at this particular moment, right? Partic I mean, credit, you know, is a different matter because you're, you're then taking a, a risk and you're getting a risk and reward out of it. And, you know, the high, the high yield market has its case is, is a kind of a beast unto itself. But if you think about investment grade corporates as well as, as, as treasuries, it's hard to imagine why you really should be invested in those, unless you have to, where you have to pen pension funds have to match liabilities. Right, right, which is kind I of the point I think that's of... a real underpinning for real estate generally. I mean, I would be very surprised if we, we don't really get much visibility on this, but the best data that I see suggests that institutional investors are probably around 11, 12% allocated to real estate. Most of that goes into private equity funds, which I think we're gonna talk about a little later. Yep. Uh, we have a rather contentious view on that one, which might be kind of interesting to rattle around your conference in a couple of in a, in a week or two. Yep. Uh, but the um, uh, eleven or twelve percent, you know, and, and this whole um, area of it fits into this whole alternative asset category, along with things like commodities and hedge funds and such like, um, and infrastructure. Um, I can only think that um, uh, we're going to see more money. Uh, allocated into the alternative bucket by institutions um, as we go forward. And you'd have to think that real estate continues to look relatively attractive. As I said, you know, I can't understand why 
you know, people aren't pulling money out of their fixed income allocation and stick it in, sticking it into things like real estate, even though I'm nervous about pricing, I'm nervous about inflation and where treasuries are. Real estate, just on a relative basis, to me, looks actually okay. <laughs> yep. Um, one last question on this before we move over to the uh, more macro conversation. Um, as an investor, why well, should back up a little bit? Uh, at Shack, there's been a lot of talk uh, in our classrooms with our students about how people are using space going forward. Uh, most right. notably, you know, office. Is there going to be more distancing? Or is there going to be a lot more tech? Is there going to be a significant amount of digital infrastructure required to manage work from home? Um, is that going to make office, you know, more expensive to operate and to invest in, uh, bring yields down? Um, how much are you thinking about that when you're picking stocks, or is that really more just too granular and you're thinking a little bit more macro about, uh, you know, portfolio earnings? Uh, no, no, it, it's very central to the, you know, we really approach this, uh, our investment in, in a thematic sense and then look for the best stocks in terms of management balance sheets. So we then blend in the, the bottom up uh, approach. So top down from the themes and then bottom down. So thinking, thinking about how people are going to be what demand for what space in what location is, is very front and center to the way we kind of start the investment process and try mm -hmm. and construct our portfolio to that extent. Um, I, I'm, you know, again, I'm, I'm going to do dinosaur talk here. Is, oh, I think I'm, I'm going to beat you I, on that I, one in a second. I, I think three or four years, I think CBD office uh, markets will be just as vibrant as they were pre-COVID. I think oh, work from home is sort of busting at the seams. And you can see, I mean, you know, you read my weekly, there was a whole bunch of news that I put in last week. You know, Goldman's bringing back, bringing folks back. Uh, Morgan Stanley's announced that they're going to have everybody back over the summer. Um, City is, is banning, Zoom, making Zoom free Fridays. <laughs> you probably saw that story. Yeah. Yep. Uh, um, the competitive pressures, I think, are going to be there. And also, of course, you know, how I said here, like as you do probably in, in Manhattan, is, you know, I mean, paying huge amount to live here and to not be able to go to the restaurant unless you're sitting in an overcoat and sitting in the street, not being able to go to the theater or the opera, you know, or go to the, uh, the Met to see yep. the, uh, you know, the fine art. I mean, you know, you kind of do have to wonder why. And we're, and we're not even looking after small children, right? Right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I'm working um, on a uh, once the city reopens again, right, and people become more comfortable about vaccine, the effectiveness of vaccines and um, and public trans the safety of public transport, etc. And in particular, I have to say, and this is kind of you know this is probably stretching the point uh, into another area, is you know the quality of life issues are addressed, and that's a political leadership question, you know, and you know don't get me going on New York and San Francisco and homelessness, etc. But it's a real problem. You know, it's a real problem. And I think, you know, it could break out of the ways, quite frankly. Uh, you know, New yeah. York's got a new mayor coming in. And, that, you know, that's, that's an issue that you kind of look at pretty seriously. But I do think a lot of service-related businesses are going to find young people want to live in these cities. They don't want to live in the suburbs, right? I mean, a point in life, it makes an awful lot of sense. You've got yeah. young children. You know, you've got them in grade school. Um, and you don't have to commute five days a week. You only do it three or four days a week. I, I'm not saying it will completely revert back, but I think the vibrancy of the coastal cities will reassert itself. And I would be surprised if we're not looking in, yeah, two or three years is probably a bit short, but three to five years, I think they'll look remarkably similar and have a similar vibrancy. You know, I lived in London for many, many years, you know, a city which has gone through being bombed out of existence. Uh, we've had, you know, the plague where a third of the population died. If you go back in history, the center of town burnt down and it came back as vibrant as ever. And, and London is, as a city, is every bit as vibrant as, as New York. Um, and yet it, the, these major cities come back. So, I, I, you know, maybe it's different this time around. I don't think so. You know, I agree with you. It's funny. I'm working on a research project with a student and we came across an article about the office sector back in 1996 in the Washington Post. And they proclaimed office buildings dead because of the information superhighway and yeah. its ability to allow people to telecommute. Obviously, yeah, the I'm, ability to engage yeah. is, is much more important than that, especially if you're early in your career. And we're seeing our students just demanding that that in-person engagement. So I think you're right on that. Right, right. Now, I think I think in particular, the uh, John, uh, Solomon is his name, at, uh, the CEO of uh, Goldman has really emphasized, which a point which has been obvious to me from the start, 
you know, the, the difficulties uh, of, of taking new hires and particular young people into these businesses and inculcating them with the, the, the ethos, mentoring them, uh, getting them uh, up to speed is, is, has been, I think, one of the, uh, the things that have, has been a real negative of, um, of the, work, the work from home. I would say yep. on, on, the, the, on the properties and the, the way we look at it, and the thing that is a real challenge, and I certainly don't have the answer, is the tech-related stuff. I mean, you know, in, in, in five or 10 years' time, are we still needing these $150 million data centers that got, gobble up huge amounts of energy uh, where I cannot underwrite the obsolescence of the of the machine that sits inside them. I am not, it's not, it's not a possible, it's not, there's no way that I can get my head around how, what returns I should be receiving over the next five years to compensate me for the, with the risks related to the obsolescence. Well, it's funny you say that because uh, this research project we're working on is looking at uh, 5G and its impact on edge computing, right. what that means for various property sectors, whether it's office, industrial or hotel or whatnot. Um, I recently toured a, a micro fulfillment logistics operation out in Brooklyn. It's a 9,000 square foot facility. Not only are they consuming a lot of uh, energy, but they're doing uh, most of their computing for the robotics moving around on site. So they're not really using the cloud um, it's it's all being done kind of at the edge in the factory. So to your point, I don't know how much um, how much uh, cloud-based computing and data centers are going to grow from here, and it's going to be more of that micro down at the down in the weeds type of, of data um, storage and analysis. And and to your point on the energy thing, um, Shaq is looking at a lot in the microgrid space right. and renewable energy to kind of power that stuff. So I think you're right. It's going to go more from the macro grid and cloud computing down to uh, the, the property or city level. Well, you know, again, the dinosaur talk is when <laughs> I, you know, soon after I started my career, um, you know, the uh, the IBM computer used to take up a whole floor of, <laughs> Of, of an office building, yep. <laughs> a CBD office building, and now we have more computing power on, on your in your laptop, yep. or even your phone probably, um, and um, and and so things have moved on. And and up to date, I think we've had such a tremendous demand placed on. You know, the engineering skills have been focused on expanding demand within you know digital um, and telecommunications. They've not been at a point where that business has matured, where the growth of demand starts to slow down. So that in order to grow your bottom line, you need to be focused on reducing your cost of supply. So, you know, they've paid any amount of money to expand their capacity to meet the increase in demand. And 5G is another manifestation of that. At some point, you know, we've all got, you know, we're fully... <laughs> fully satisfied with what electronic communication services that we have, right? Uh, or at least it's not growing at the same pace. Right. And I think the engineering skill will be focused on reducing the costs of delivering that service. And I think we will very easily see a shrinkage of the amount of space uh, related. I mean, because you, you've been to a data center, is a vast amount of the, uh, the costs related to this is, is, the, is the energy production and the standby facilities that you've got to have to maintain 100% service at any one moment in time. Yep. Um, look, it's the top of the hour. We've got 30 minutes and um, there's a very interesting topic as you alluded to that we're going to discuss uh, the outlook for uh, the private equity sector um, and what it could mean for the REIT space. I want to leave probably you tell me a 15 minute conversation for that. Um, sure. So we've got about 15 minutes to cover some of the stuff on, on here on page six. We've covered a bit of it so far, um, but I want to dig in um, a little bit on, on some of the major trends on this page that uh, our students and, and property investors in general should be thinking about, um, but our students thinking about when they go to the REIT conference as well. Um, we've spoken about the reopening trade and its impact on economic growth. Uh, I will put inflation in that, that, com in that statement, um, so I'll point to the steepening of the yield curve. Uh, the relationship of that with the reopening trade. Um, I don't want to get too deep into monetary and fiscal policy, but maybe I'd love to hear your thoughts on the possibility of an infrastructure bill and how that might uh, impact favorably REITs, but probably more likely the real asset ecosystem. Um, and then maybe we spend the bulk of the time uh, of the topics on this page uh, in the upper right, that, that inflation conversation and kind of where you're seeing it, where you're concerned about it and where you might be uh, excited about it. Um, oh, oh my, you're throwing a lot at me there. So Yes, I know. I was just about to say that as I realized it. <laughs> yeah, you might need to remind me of some of the <laughs> hit there. So, 
Yeah, just a million again, without this, this is not a bond, treasury bond uh, sort of uh, uh, hour. Uh, but uh, I think the other thing, is, you've got the curve steepening, you've got the jack in yields, which is pretty apparent for everybody. Um, and, um, and then it also, uh, you've got the break evens, um, and I'm assuming many people on the call understand what those are. I won't dwell on that, but that's been widening. If you look at the five, is the one which has really been kind of showing the, the big move there. Uh, but you know, if you look at the ten, which is obviously our first point of go-to as, as, as real estate investors, mm -hmm. uh, you look at two thirty there, um, and that's been going up. And then you know, the narrowing of the uh, degree to which uh, you've got negative real yields is also a, a factor. And again, if you've got negative real yield, real yields, it begats me to know and understand why uh, people are still buying treasuries, <laughs> unless it's a big <laughs> rate. Okay, so. Um, and in terms of what you should be looking at, you know, the Fed is said to, oh, it's actually over on the other side there at the top there. You know, the PCE index um, is, uh, is, is supposedly the, the index that the Fed pays most attention to as opposed to the, the BLS uh, quarterly, uh, sorry, the monthly. And, and then again, you know, they look at the core numbers as opposed to the, um, uh, as opposed to the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the headline. Um, so, you know, the, the expectation is that those numbers, and you know, the Fed has already told us this, is, you know, we're, we intend to keep rates slow till through 23, right? Now, you know, I don't, I don't think it's realistic, and there are many people in the market that seem to think it's unrealistic as well. Uh, but, um, you know, the expectation is that we are actually going to see, um, as particularly as the economy continues to accelerate, there are going to be supply um, uh, block-ups and, and uh, backups that create inflationary pressure um, you know i mean for example if we were all okay to go flying you know the airline tickets are going to go up aren't they right to state the to state the obvious right and yep. gas prices are already you're already seeing some inflationary pressures within the system commodities uh, obviously gas is the easiest thing to look at there uh, that are actually uh, rising in value house prices are obviously uh, have been rising very rapidly you know three or four times the rate of income growth for a number of years now that's not long-term sustainable um, particularly if you got higher rates as well so those are the things on on on, uh, on inflation you know we, we are going to get if you just look at the way of year over year you know we were in the bottom you know the bottom of the economy in terms of the post-covid initial response in uh, march and april so it's going to be in the next couple of months that we're really going to see you know inflation pop up to that two and a half, three percent. The question is, and it, there's a really a two-way pull amongst economists on this, is you've got folks like Larry Summers saying it could easily get out of control. And at the same time, we're throwing all this money at the economy. You know, you put in this number, you know, with all the fiscal support, it's about 25% of GDP. You know, that's vastly more than any other country is throwing at this, by the way, right? Yep. And you ordinarily, you know, if you did, I think um, the Obama stuff that came through after the uh, global recession, great, great recession was like five, right? So we're already vastly over um, spending by comparison on the fiscal spend. Now, a lot of people say that wasn't enough. And that's why it took so long to, for the economy to pull out of uh, what we saw in 08 and 09. Uh, but 25% is, is a truly enormous number. You know, other people say, you know, the inflation is going to blip up and then go back down again because it's not going to be really in place long enough to see, you know, labor, for example, push for higher wages, right? Which is what you typically see in inflationary periods that I started my career back in the 70s and saw in the 80s, um, where you get this, um, this, this cost push um, from... Um, uh, the, the, um, as opposed to demand. What we're seeing in, in uh, what we'll see this year is demand pull, as, as the economists say, where you're seeing excess of demand over supply. And we talk about airline tickets, for example, as a, a point in question. Uh, but when you see inflationary expectations start to build in, um, then you start to see people push for higher wages and that kind of you know, has a cascading effect right throughout the economy because obviously people's uh, the cost of labor. So that's, that's a big thing to, to look at. So to that's me, a fair you know, point. The, um, sorry. Oh, go ahead, I'll let you run that up. No, I was gonna say, uh, to, to just go back on your point is, you know, now we've got, you know, this, um, we've got the infrastructure bill coming along and with it, let's not forget the tax proposals, uh, which are at least in part supposed to, to pay for this. I mean, we're talking of, you know, infrastructure is, I don't know whether they're settled on this $3 billion, trillion dollar number, but it was, you know, the number I've seen is two to four 
Obviously, there's a tremendous need to spend this money. You know, interest rates are very low. So if you're borrowing, there's an argument for doing this, particularly as you're improving essentially the productivity of the country. And our infrastructure clearly has lagged behind you know, what, um, what we see in other countries. Uh, it really is in need and it has a very quick effect. Obviously, you create hiring, you create jobs in terms of manufacturing, you know, the, you know, the things that need to go in um, to support an infrastructure program. So that would, there's certainly a lot. I mean, and wrapped up with the Democrats, it's going to be there's got to be a lot of um, a green elements to it as well. So, um, so that would be kind of interesting. But then you get to the, um, the you know, how, how do you pay for this? And um, and again, that's where you know, and again we were just chatting about this before we came on. Is I'm astonished. It's a, it's a manifestation of the fact that Wall Street seems to be only pre able to focus on one issue at a time, and at the moment it's inflation. <laughs> Yep. We're not able to really focus in on what's going to happen to taxes, but you know, I mean, across the board, whether you're talking corporate taxes going back up to 28, whether you're talking about capital gains going back to uh, income tax rates, um, you're talking about some very major impact. There's actually a financial transfer tax being spoken on as well. Um, so a lot of these are going to have very direct bearing on investment pricing, the prices of in, uh, investments. And in particular on the capital gains tax, I mean, I'm not really even started to get my head around what impact that might have on the way that we think about property finance. Because, you know, basically uh, the, the structures we've used, whether it be a partnership structure um, or whether we're actually looking to uh, put a lot of debt on so we can perhaps get uh, the, the, uh, the relief on the interest charges or minimize our income because we're being you know, picking the numbers in round terms, we're being taxed at 40% on our, our income and capital gains is 20. Uh, why wouldn't you want to be putting, if you can afford to live on minimal income, right? <laughs> then you're going to be putting all of your eggs in the capital gains tax basket. So, um, yeah, again, that is to be watched. And it's going to have to come this year because as we talked about, the political agenda really means that, you know, if he leaves it to next year, he's going to be, you know, the Biden administration and the Democrats are going to be fighting the midterms, and then they certainly not want to be stirring up a hole in its nest by taking on, um, on, on, you know, the very fierce business and wealthy lobby that will push very strongly against uh, some of these tax proposals, which are going to hurt that class, the donor class for the Republicans, pretty severely in their pockets. So uh, to summarize a lot of that, um, reopening trade is, is in play. Um, that means we're, we should probably be thinking a little bit more about uh, push-pull price inflation rather than uh, cost-driven cost, cost -driven, uh, inflation. Yeah, Demand-pull. Demand Sorry, demand-pull, demand cost-push. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the global supply chain probably not significantly disrupted uh, from... Well, you've got onshoring, which is also a source of inflation. Right. I mean, for example, you know, obviously, Which is more of a labor cost year, issue, right? This this time last year, we were desperately short of PPE mm -hmm. and we were short of ventilators. Um, and where were we getting from? They were coming from China. So, you know, I mean, this that, is a strategic uh, kind of policy that's going to be, I mean, nobody's really talking too much about this, um, except in the broadest terms. But clearly, we're going to have to bring that on shore. Clearly, it's probably going to mean that we're going to be looking at higher prices for that. We're going to have to spend more. Um, on those issues alone, right? And I think you're going to have to, you know, and, and I know, again, it's not, it's outside my area, but I'm aware of the debate. It's a lot of the uh, precious metals um, that are needed for a lot of the tech-related activity are only sourced at the moment from China, yes. right? So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, we've, we've got to find out some alternatives or we've got to, you know, in terms of use of material, or we've got to find out somewhere else to go mine this stuff. Right. Got to get back on the moon, I guess, right? You know, I mean, tension with China isn't going to be going down, is it? Unfortunately. No, it does not appear to be. So, but but this is going to result in, we'll call it some inflation, whether it's temporary or longer term, which will probably force the Fed's hand on interest rates, will yep. probably drive a further steepening or at least a rising of, the, of the, the yield curve. But that may or may not negatively impact commercial real estate pricing, right? Because if there's a reopening trade, people going back to the office, things are starting to, to get back into gear and there's more risk appetite by lenders, by equity investors, we'll see some of the 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 weight, the wall of capital sitting on the sidelines now. Well, Given you might where see, rates you might are coming see, yeah. from, we should be able to weather yeah. a rise in yeah. tenure, right? Yeah, I think at the moment, and why I would be 
uh, relatively constructive on the outlook for real estate and, and the REITs is, is I think that the inflation hedge quality, right, mm -hmm. which we wrote about in that paper, which I think you circulated to folks, yep. um, and, um, um, and and the dividend yield, I think, will be, will be supportive. And, um, and I think the Fed is going to continue to be pretty cautious. I mean, the worry I have on the Fed, I mean, sorry, we're jumping around here, but these are kind of important points that I think to get out is, is yeah, the, the, if you look at the K-shaped the K recovery, right? I mm -hmm. mean, mm -hmm. a lot of people have done really quite well financially out, out, out of this period. I mean, it's not been great for the country. There's lots of negatives. But financially, you know, those folks in a job that can work from home have done well financially. Uh, but there's, a, you know, there's this 10 million people that are now unemployed now that weren't unemployed last year. And we've got to have, you know, government is trying to devise policies to help those people and get them back into work. And, and you know, what I'm fearful of is the Fed is going to be focused on trying to get some of these people back to work who aren't necessarily going back to work anyway. Right. So, you know, we could end up in, you know, a Fed that is very reluctant to move. And the fear that the investors have across the board is the Fed is going to have to move and move, you know, much more aggressively. Um, and that's, that's, you know, gradual is fine. We can deal with that. But capital markets can deal with that. Is where the Fed is going to be forced to move aggressively to counter inflationary forces, which, you know, when, I mean, again, you, you, you look at the summers of this world, I mean, they are really kind of, and he's on the left, of course, as, a, as, a, as an economist. He was part of the Obama administration. Um, and you've got, you know, you really could be talking about the Fed having to move up rates quite a lot. And that would definitely be a hit to real estate asset values, right? At the yeah. moment, if you say, you know, the Fed is going to kind of respond and maybe it's going to move rates next year. It's only going to be gradual. I think that's a pretty positive scenario for us. We see, you know, the income growth side is more than outweighs the extra cost of, uh, you know, the increase to our cost of capital, right? Because you can factor in, you do the models, you can factor in a greater rate, rate of growth in NOI. But if right. we see NOI not growing that rap, yep. you know, we're going to grow at the same rate. But your cost of capital is skyrocketing. Ergo, you, you, the cost, you know, the, the value of your asset is going to be going down. And and that's aside from the debate about taxes. <laughs> well, so yes, I, I agree with all that, and that's I'm glad to hear you say that's what we've been talking about uh, in my capital markets class and other conversations in the hallway, digital hallway. Um, we can dig into the tax policy aspect. Suffice to say, it's probably going to be really nebulous, pretty ugly as we go through the political uh, process of it. But I think in the meantime, what that really is going to do is could possibly impact the demand for private equity investment from investors. Is that is that right? And is that part of your, your PE thesis? Yeah, I think it will. I think if they change capital gains, for example, if we went even halfway between 20, if they went to 30, for example, using my 40 on income and 20 on, um, on cap gains, I think we're going to have to revisit all our models, aren't we? And, and uh, our IRRs and return expectations, right? Do financial structures, it's going to be much less preferable to, um, to, uh, to be as levered. Particularly if there's a relatively lower growth than expected in the economy, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. And then you get, I get bound to, and I think you put a note in here. And we should say that, you know, when I first put your, my notes up to you, I put, uh, Private equity uh, past peak, and, and somehow that got deleted. I don't. I think you don't. Want to, <laughs> you don't want to. You don't want to frighten the horses. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be overly biased toward REITs. Uh, I'm not as the REIT guy as it is, but uh, yeah, I, know, I look at. You know, I just got. I just got seller's remorse. I worked in private equity for a little while, so you know, I'm just. I'm just. You know, I kicked myself having jumped out of it in the right and gone, gone back into the public arena. I should have. I should have my own personal wealth. I have <laughs> private equity. <laughs> look, there's, there's definitely, look, if you look at the right hand side of this page, um, you didn't necessarily sign off on this, so we won't uh, assign responsibility to you on this, but I kind of mapped out some of the, the pros and cons, so to speak, between the REIT structure and the uh, private equity structure. Um, for me, it's, it's a little bit less about REITs in general and more about being public specifically. Um, I think the IPO, we can go back and, and talk about the, the going public process here. Um, whether the IPO process is somewhat broken or should be evolved, whether SPACs are going to be part of that uh, from a, from a no, more normalized uh, economic return structure, i.e. not a high growth tech vehicle, um, but more traditional real estate. I don't know whether reverse mergers into shells 
I don't know um, whether there's something to be done there. For me, it's, it's really about thinking about um, transparency, liquidity, and, and the public markets really being better equipped for core, core plus investing rather than um, high volatility, longer duration, value add and opportunistic, which is probably better suited for, for private equity, right? Um, so for me, there's kind of this, it's more of the public market, private market story rather than purely private real estate. But having said that, um, one of the hallmarks of, of PERE is the use of leverage, right? And so to your point, if we're at the end of a 20, 30, 40 year uh, bull run in interest rates, um, leverage isn't going to be as valuable to real estate players as it has been over the past few decades, um, regardless of what economic growth looks like. And so maybe, maybe we've been financial engineering a lot of value add and opportunistic returns because of that use of leverage. And, and really real estate in general is truly more of a core plus type of investment X some of the you know development and heavy value add stuff, and therefore perfectly suited for a low leverage, high liquidity, um, highly transparent public vehicle. Well, I think you know if you, if I think about what the real estate returns from from public are, is you're getting the sort of CPI type underlying growth. So two percent could say two percent. Just throw some numbers around here. Two percent. You get a point out of leverage. You know, forty percent plus mm -hmm. or minus. Um, you get 4% dividend yield, rounding numbers up. So, you, and maybe there's another point from acquisitions or development if the company is geared up to do, to do that. So you're at so high single digits. Up, up, you add all that up together, right? And so you get a total return of about 7 or 8%. But that includes the leverage. I'm throwing in the leverage on that, right? I think that's kind of the realistic return you're going to get. I mean, you could say, obviously, in a more inflationary environment, you're going to get better than... That uh, that two percent, and you know, but it's not going to go. You, it's hard to see how you get to anything other than kind of low single digits. Sorry, high single digits on the return. Mm -hmm. When you look at private equity, these guys have been tremendous beneficiaries, and hats off to them. They've taken full advantage. They've been one of the key beneficiaries of this 30, 40 year bull run that we've had in bonds. So interest rates have declined. So asset prices have gone up. We've used leverage, which has meant that the cost of debt has actually gone down, probably during the period. They bought, they stuck a load of leverage on, and then they sell, right? Yeah, I mean, the, cha the challenge I have in the idea that you go for uh, um, uh, the opportunistic and um, uh, for side the spectrum on in terms of private equity is, you know, how many of these funds really are geared up to do that? I, I would say that the permanent capital vehicles um, such as REITs are actually much better placed in most cases to attract and retain and have already in many cases the people that are, are on board to do that. Uh, private equity is basically full of financial engineers that have been riding, riding the curve. <laughs> do you see, it's, it's, uh, I struggle with this a little bit, right, because it is a very embedded uh, sector, right? Um, there's incentives to keep it. Uh, not all, not all investors want to see um, repricing of their investment on a on a daily or minute by minute basis. Some investors, you tell me, prefer to have you know invested a hundred bucks and it's it's a hundred bucks until it's not in you know five years. And hopefully, at that point, it's you know one hundred and thirty bucks or whatever it ends up being. Um, and there's incentives for for managers to raise money and and intermediaries to stay in the in the in that process. So do you see that evolving at all? Do you see it doing so just incrementally? Or well, is it really good? Or could you have a big structural change like tax tax code? Um, well, yeah, I'm setting aside the taxes here. I mean, I, the, I mean, clearly, you know, the private equity model is, is more vulnerable to those tax changes we were just talking about, whether it be capital gains, which would eliminate, by the way, the carried interest, which I think is unconscionable as a tax break and should have been eliminated years ago. Um, as a taxpayer, <laughs> okay, yep. But um, you know, go down to that the the the, uh, uh, the 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 one the paragraph on the right hand side. But see, if, if we're in an environment where you're not going to get at any at all cap, cap rate compression, we are then looking realistically in an environment where your returns are really going to be driven by your growth in NOI. So that much is 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 so um, it's going to be less financial engineering um, and less 
you know, people that are buying and selling more aggressively. Mm -hmm. So you're back to, you know, the people that can manage those assets the best over time. And that really hasn't been something that we've really had terribly in, uh, you know, emphasized on in, 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 the, um, in the private equity structure. Uh, the other thing I would say on, on private equity um, is that um, uh, you basically got, um, uh, you know, the, um, the many investors don't want the volatility, particularly if you look at the, um, uh, the, um, the non-traded REITs. So that's, yep. the, and, and many of these things I'm talking about here for private equity, if you think on the institutional side, have a resonance in terms of the, you know, the, this non-traded REITs, which have really come back pretty, pretty well, actually, particularly uh, led by Brook, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Blackstone has been really a pioneer in kind of regenerating, uh, re-energizing that area. So people have not wanted the volatility that you get with the public side because you've obviously got pricing that jumps up and down and is sensitive to all these things. If you don't have a secondary market, you don't have any volatility, right? Because that's right. the price you pay. There's no liquidity. Yeah. But if I'm right in thinking, you know, most of the growth is going to come from income, and those returns which I just talked about about high single digits, that isn't going to be enough to persuade institutional investors uh, that they can just give right a hundred million dollars and say come back and see me in seven years. If right. returns are going to be going from fifteen down to seven or eight, um, I, I think now, we're, admittedly, I think we're in a kind of lower return environment across the board on all assets um, as we look forward uh, compared to where we've been. Uh, but you know, private equity has been generating fifteen percent. 15% or so uh, after, ta after, your ta after, after fees. Uh, I think uh, institutions have been very happy with that. You know, you've got the argument that it's, it fits and is not correlated to some of the other assets, which of course is a bit of a head fake because you don't have the liquidity and the pricing that right. you get in the other areas. Uh, but I, I think you, know, you, you will get a sea check. I mean, look, this is very slow to move. You know, there's a lot of kind of inertia uh, that's almost in... In, uh, absolutely in place, fixed in place when it comes to, you know, whether the pension fund consultants or the people, you know, the property managers that sit in these institutions, uh, they're very wedded to the status quo. It's done them very well. But if those returns start coming under pressure, as I believe they will, given we're going to be in an income growth rather than a, a cap rate compression growth uh, driven environment as we go forward, um, I, I think it's going to come more into question. Um. I don't disagree with that. Uh, the other aspect that I've been thinking about is, you know, everybody's been very excited about ESG for the past, we'll call it three years. It's been around for five to 10 years. It used to be called impact investing. Yeah. Um, it's, um, it's now, it was appropriately, I think, lumped into one category, E, S, and G, but now we've, we've gotten so used to it and there's so much attention to it, they probably really should be separated uh, into their individual yeah. silos, right? But if I think about that becoming even more normalized, um, whether it's it's the G or the S, uh, maybe for REITs less so the E, and I think about um, financial reporting standards. Do you see that as having an impact on a shift from from private equity to REITs? Well, it seems like the public companies are much better placed to do this. And in fact, if you um, many of you will be aware, if you look on the websites, uh, you, many of them actually produce pretty extensive reports on on ESG matters. So, you know, I think. I go back to, you know, it started in 95, you know, the REIT sector really in the, in the early 90s, which was about the time I start, first get, became involved. Um, and, you know, they always had, they were always on the outside, you know, REITs were always having to prove it. And they've become part of the establishment today, but they still feel themselves to be sort of, you know, having to prove it a bit more. So we never didn't really have the legacy issues of terrible governance. I mean, there were some governance issues that people had to address, but... Uh, you know, and still do, quite frankly. But, you know, we never were kind of on the outside. We were all, so we were on the outside. So we always have to try a little bit harder. Um, and, um, and so uh, I think on governance, we're, we're pretty good. And on environmental, I think they got the message, pretty, many companies got the message pretty early uh, that they could get perhaps by higher rents or they could fill the buildings more easily um, if they told the tenants that they were green because that fitted in with what the tenants wanted to tell their customers. Yep. So particularly in things like um, uh, retail, um, offices, um, uh, distribution centers, for example, distribution, all of these things were, uh, were sort of, I mean, again, you go back to that point on, on the, the energy 
usage of the data centers. I mean, some of them say they're going to be carbon neutral. I don't know whether they're kind of, you know, going to buy Brazil to uh, to keep them preserve the forest. To do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not clear to me that they're going to be able to make those buildings kind of low energy right. uh, in, in usage terms. Um, but, um, you know, the social side is, you know, we're, we're kind of, you know, we don't employ that many people in these companies for the most part. Um, so the social side isn't really so um, kind of um, uh, a, a bigger factor. And on the environmental side, in fact, interestingly enough, I had a conversation, um, you know, that we are seeing green bonds issued uh, mm -hmm. by the, by the, uh, the REITs. And uh, obviously they have to uh, adhere to the use of those funds for uh, green projects. Uh, but as I said, they, they kind of got this message actually some little, little while ago. Um, and in fact, I did speak to Boston Properties who recently issued, I think it was at 750, 800 million unsecured. And they actually got slightly better pricing than they would do by inv investing in a, or issuing a regular bond because it's actually a broader market. Right. So this ESG is, is definitely, you know, it's making a lot of noise now. Um, it's got, um, it, it seems to me that there's, you know, there's a tremendous incentive. And then we get back to this whole debate about whether, you know, the purpose of the public company, is it to make profits for the shareholders exclusively, like Milton Friedman told us back in the 70s, 60s and 70s, the 70s, I think it was, or, or is it got this broader uh, kind of social um, responsibility to stakeholders of, of all descriptions? And I think we're in an environment where the pendulum has swung towards, you know, being uh, kind of satisfying the stakeholder argument mm -hmm. as opposed to being purely to satisfy the shareholders. Um, so how far we go yeah. with this? I mean, you know, again, I, I think, you know, on corporate governance, uh, you know, we still have many major companies where the chairman is the CEO. Uh, we haven't split that, for example. Uh, we yeah. still get poor representation from, you know, folks that didn't go to the same school or have the same skin color, you know, <laughs> the diversity argument. Um, is still pretty low by comparison with other developed economies. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, so uh, uh, I still think there's, uh, there's some way to go on, on many of these issues. Uh, but I would say, I think the REITs are actually, on relative terms, actually pretty well, pretty doing pretty well, actually, on most of these things. Good, good. It, doesn't, um, it does not influence, if you want to ask me, does it influence my investment decision? Kind of uh, a little at the margin, I would say. Good enough. I'd like to see I would have guessed that, so it's good. I would like to see it, but it really doesn't make much of a difference. Um, uh, but I do think it's increasing, um, and uh, you know our capital providers are kind of interested in, um, in 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 asking us how much we're kind of putting it into into the mix here. Um, great. Well, look, we've we've got about a minute left here. Rather oh, than asking, okay. um, yeah, I don't know where the time went. Um, rather than asking you uh, where students should be putting their money. Um, I'll ask you, <laughs> where do you think students should be focusing their time uh, in position of their careers uh, with respect to property types, whatnot, and, you know, if you can winnow that down in a minute or so. <laughs> oh, gee, you should have prepped me. <laughs> I might need to come back on that one. Again. Um, well, I would say you've got to be flexible in terms of your, your career. I mean, uh, there's probably many people that I've spoken to, you know, because, you know, I I do teach, I have taught at NYU for a little while, but um, and um, but everybody seemed to aspire to go to work, well, many people aspire to working for, for private equity. Um, I do have my doubts about whether that is going to be quite such a vibrant area as we go forward. Um, I do think real estate generally is going to need some very bright people as we go forward. I think redevelopment is an area which to me um, offers, uh, uh, is, is, is kind of underpopulated um, and I think is going to continue to uh, to, to grow uh, as an area, um, and in terms of property types, um, you know, I, I, as I said, I think CBD office will be back, uh, but you know, residential continues to to work and just keep flexible. I mean, we're seeing, you know, in the, in the particularly in the public area, it's kind of much faster moving than the actual physical market in the sense that you know we're seeing some of these new areas come to the fore and become established as as established institutional areas for investment. Um, and um, and you know they're they're quite exciting. I mean, you know, industrial, for example, was 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 beneath beneath contempt when I first started in the right. U.S. in '95. Um, and also things like uh, medical office buildings were were considered to be sort of you know poor investment, uh, self storage. So just keep your options open and, and be willing to uh, 
to sort of uh, look at some new areas rather than thinking you've got to be in the established areas. And I would say more generally is, um, you know, when you're looking for, uh, you know, your first, first job, uh, the critical thing um, is, okay, it'd be great to go with a kind of the established names. It is actually far more important to, to, uh, to find out who you're going to be working with um, and can give you those, uh, you know, those, those real career starting thing uh, advice and, and, and be a model for you over those first couple of years. Um, and, and that really is a bit of a crapshoot because uh, you're as likely to find somebody that's going to be a real mentor and be a real inspiration to you working for a small company as you can find when you work for Bain or a Goldman Sachs. True. Good stuff. Um, David, as always, appreciate your insight and your time. Um, I will send around a copy of this deck to, uh, to all the participants in the call. Um, feel free to send either one of us uh, follow-up questions. Uh, contact information can be found at the, the last two pages. Again, thank you, everybody. David, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, anybody, anybody wanting to follow up with me directly, just email me, and I'll try and respond as best I can with all of this. I know we've covered a lot of territory. Um, and, uh, and for those that are attending the conference, I, uh, I think hopefully it's going to be a very interesting time. This is it's much more interesting to talk about uh, you know, where we are in the cycle now uh, then we're kind of halfway up or at the end when everybody's in denial as to the, <laughs> in the final innings. But remember, you know, the bond market got it right when we, we had inverted yield curve last year. But, I'm sorry, That's 18 true. months ago. Actually, it was right, right? Yep. It, wasn't, it was not pricing in COVID. It just said, you know, hey, this is the end of the cycle, guys, right? Get ready. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. Good point. All righty. Thank you.